This is Women for Gun Rights with your host, Amanda Suffolk, part of the DC Project. Hey folks, here we are, ready to start a whole new show, Women for Gun Rights. I'm Amanda Suffolk, and with me is Rebecca Schmoy. Hi, Amanda. It's Hi. good to see you. It's good to see you, too. So um, we are here recording another segment of this. So every Friday night, you'll find us here on this station. So you can tune in. You can see the amazing women that are doing things for the Second Amendment. And they are everywhere. And the things that they are doing are just phenomenal. And Rebecca, you're from the from the state of Kansas, right? Yes. Um, I do have a pair of ruby slippers. Um, they don't get me home. <laughs> they don't get you no. home. You can't click them a couple times no, and things happen. No. <laughs> but no, so you're you're in Kansas. How did you get involved with the DC project? Oh, that's a long story. I'll try to condense it down a little bit. Um, We've got time. We've got yeah, time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So back um, when Sandy Hook happened, um, mm -hmm. I I was. Um, really interested uh, when the red shirt Bloomberg moms came on scene mm -hmm. because when they started saying that they spoke for all moms and that we should teach our children to fear guns then I knew that I was not alone out there and that there were other moms that um, absolutely understood that we need to be able to protect our children mm -hmm. and so the easiest way to do that to be equal or greater force is of course with a firearm and so I searched social media and I found one million moms against gun control and okay. then I added my voice to the conversation and pretty soon I was uh, part of driving the conversation and uh, after nearly nine years of doing this I have met the most amazing people and with that I have met several of the DC Project ladies and I just kind of became part of the became group. Became part of the group. So you were like pick me I'd like to be involved and I see the mission and I like what the mission has to offer. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I too. I mean, I, I, I tell people that going to something where DC Project women are is like going to summer camp with your heroes because the amazing caliber of women, the things that they do and how they do them is just is absolutely phenomenal. And um, you get to see so many different skill sets. They're doing so many different things. And so each, each woman has got like a superpower that heads in a different direction. And so yours is this voice, this amazing voice in the One Million Moms Against Gun Control. And um, I've seen them, them, you know, the them, come after you in so many ways. And you are so calm and cool and collected. And, and you can put together a whole, you know, just, just a package of information that outlines your position in a way to where they really can't argue that point so then they go away they really do um, everything that they do comes back to emotion so if you can head off the emotion or if you can sub like divert the divert. emotion okay. um, to a different direction mm -hmm. um, one of the more popular things that I have done recently was when I was a trying to explain that everybody deserves to be protected and whereas the other side will try to tell you that you you are not safe with a firearm and that you can't possibly um, be able to navigate this world then I said why not? why not you can do all these other amazing things and you're worth protecting I know you can learn this let us help you learn this right they send women to space you know, there's women engineers, women police officers, you know, women pilots, women doing everything. So there's not this spot where, oh, it's a mechanical device, and so women don't understand those things. Exactly. It's, it's really demeaning as a woman to be told by other women that you're going to, if you try to protect yourself, you're going to have your gun taken away from you, and it's going to be used against you. And why would it be? Would you say that to a man? I mean, uh, the, how demeaning is that? We're, we want to be for all women, but not you, because y you've chosen to protect yourself in a way that we don't approve of. You've chosen a tool that we don't like. Yes. So that nasty tool means that you don't get to play with us. You don't get... <laughs> 
you, you know, and so, and you don't get to defend yourself or your family, and so you're just going to have to quietly go off into the darkness, and if they pick you as a victim, you're just going to have to take it. Oh, absolutely, because we don't like you anyway, so what do we care if you're a victim? It's, it's a terrible mentality for somebody, mm -hmm. especially if you're going to say something like that in public. I, you really, if you're on our side, um, you really do kind of grow this thicker skin and you just look at the comments and you just go, wow, that says so much more about you than it does about those of us who are willing to protect ourselves, who are willing to be our own first responders. Um, the hate that we feel is really an explanation of why we are actively training to protect ourselves. Right, and so we're trying to deflect that hate, not, not reflect it, right? So, so we don't give hate back in, you know, hate comes, hate goes, but we, we'll deflect it, we'll redirect it, and, and then continue on with the focus goal that we have, which is to save lives, make people safer, not just feel safer, right? but make them actually safer. Because it's not really about feelings, it's about facts. And how dare you bring the F word into the conversation? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the real four letter F word. Fact. Fact. <laughs> right. And we don't like that. We no. don't Yeah, there there is that. So okay, so Ma, one million moms against gun control is based out of where? And what what's their mission? What do they hope to accomplish? All right, so um, One Million Moms Against Gun Control was originated um, just kind of as a knee-jerk reaction to the, the red shirt moms. And so it really went national. We have affiliates and people who support us and help from all 50 states. And um, Mary Callison and I, she's in Illinois and I'm in Kansas, and we really kind of run the show and um, it's kind of been a tag team thing for, for several years. We have a lot of people to help out. Um, mm -hmm. Jill with Mom at Arms, she provides. Okay. And she's like oh, Virginia or something. Yeah. yeah. And she's and, another one of those spitfires. Oh, yeah. She's right? fantastic. And she really helps us out with a lot of content. And um, we, we could not do what we do without all of the help that we get mm -hmm. from acro across the country. And really, what we are doing is. If you find our uh, social media page and you want more information, whether it's more information about the laws in your state, whether it's more information about how to change the laws in your state, whether you want to know who your reps are, whether you want a training class close to you, if you're trying to find a good resource of information, we can find someone in every state that can help you, someone that is regional to you, and that that way mm -hmm. it's not just some talking head from somewhere telling you, you know, oh, well, I think in your state we can actually find you someone in your state to specifically explain what you need to know. Well, and they know the answer specific to your laws, they know yes. the answer specific to your politics. So they're very engaged where where the rubber hits the road. Right. And so having those resources as opposed to, well, just call the attorney general and you'll be fine. You'll or be fine. Trying, trying to guess at another state's gun laws is impossible. Oh my God, we, we sit and have like lunch conversations when we do things <laughs> that are that are national, when we move around the country. And so you'll be sitting, well, actually today, and we'll talk about what we were doing today. We're sitting today with um, Nebraska, let's see, I'm trying to think, California, Nebraska, Ohio, Massachusetts, Kansas, Kansas South Dakota, and um, Georgia, all at the same table talking, what's your laws, how does that work, we're, right. you know, back and forth, and so it allows you to really get a cross-section of what is happening, and what's happening in your state versus another state, because then you can actually try to, if you're trying, if you, something is broken in your state, you can figure out another state to model it after or to ask questions or to get from, or you can offer resources that your state did this to someone else that lives in non-free America, if you, right? <laughs> if you will. Yeah, yeah, the states that don't seem to recognize that the Second Amendment covers all of us. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, we were having a conversation about Dick Heller today. 
And one of the things that amazes, absolutely amazes me, was that the Heller decision, which is the absolute cornerstone Supreme Court decision on whether you can have a gun in your house, that decision did not pass out of the Supreme Court until June of 2008. So everybody says we have the Second Amendment, we have the Constitution, and it says these. Well, the Supreme Court did not confirm it. They did not do the interpretation, so it had left it to smaller courts to decide in little pockets all around the country until 2008. And that is just, that's amazing to me. Right. The fact that we all have, it's it's we the people. And so we all have access to the Second Amendment, but the fact that it can look so different. And even with having the Heller decision, everything is still so different. It's almost like traveling to different countries depending on what states you're going to. Mm -hmm. And the idea that because we preach, you know, the founding fathers all the time, but the fact is, is that we still don't have equality under the Second Amendment because no. uh, different states get to determine what what is passable, what's permissible, and what they're going to allow you to do. Right. The Heller was just a slice of a pie. Yeah. And then McDonald followed after that. Mm-hmm. Then Azell followed after that. And right now there is... Um, oh, darn. What, it used to be Corlette that is going through the, the thing, and it... it, it now has a new name so it's new york state rifle and pistol association versus uh begins with a b but i don't remember what it is but there is a there is a court case that right now is working through the supreme court they're hearing they're hearing the statements like as we speak actually it's like this week yes and so that's that's pretty darn amazing so let's talk a little bit about how we came to be in the same place so that we're filming something and we're not in two little boxes like Marsha and Cindy Brady. We are we are actually side by side. And um, how did that come about? All right, so um, there's this amazing opportunity for all Second Amendment uh, interested media, whether you uh, write articles or make content, uh, memes and things like that, or whether you have shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's called AMCON, and it's amazing, and I've been meaning to get to an AMCON for years, and I finally got to come, and yeah. I got to speak, and it was amazing, not because I got to speak, but because I was able to sit in this conference and learn so much. I had to take notes. I was constantly taking notes because there's no possible way that I can retain all of the great information. I'm going to be going back through it for the next probably month and just trying to really apply the things that I, I was able to pick up from AMCON. And... Uh, then I get to hang out with cool people like you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, I, to me, AMCON, the beauty of AMCON is the fact that you make these connections that not only did they stand up in front and they said, you know, when I do this, this works. When I do this, it doesn't work. Or there's a couple options or there's this or that, um, which are all good. And, oh, by the way, AMCON is recorded so you can actually access it and see it. So last year's and this year's are recorded and available. But it is. It, then you exchange phone numbers and contacts and so so if I've got a question I can then just pick up the phone and say I mean Sarah Cade does these amazing videos yeah. on lighting and right now we are we had found a corner in the hotel that actually has a skylight so that's you can see the lighting is kind of got got some got some yeah. issues but it, we it's were not, paying attention Sarah we really were <laughs> It, we were, but this is the lightest place in, yeah, really in the is. hotel. So, so this is where we're doing it. But so she would give you advice as to how it all works and what you do and how how to showcase yourself the best, so that when you're out talking to somebody, you don't look like um, you don't look like a horror movie or you know you're backlit or you're lit one way or um, you're not the floating head with you're not, the same color, same color shirt, <laughs> same color background, the whole thing, and there's just a head there, right? Um, I know my home studio, at one point I had to call her because I was orange. I, I really, my hair was orange, my face was, it was like, there is something. And she's like, it's not your lights, it's the fact that you've got a skylight and the skylight is messing with your lights. So here's what you have to do. <laughs> so, so she guided me through it. But 
I mean, as much as we're getting in the weeds on that, it's really critical because as a Second Amendment advocate, if you're putting yourself out there and you're offering to be in a Zoom meeting or on a resource to like a news program or one of those kind of things, people make an instant decision on your credibility, on how you look, how you dress, and how the, the scene is framed. They look at it and they're like, well, you either know your stuff or you don't know your stuff. And if you don't right. look professional when you walk in or when you sit down or when the, when the camera flicks on, you have lost that credibility and you have an uphill battle to get it back. Absolutely. First impressions mean everything. And in this business, we can't afford to give somebody a distraction. Mm -hmm. because the message is so important and there are so many people who don't want to hear the message that you really have to take things like lighting or backdrop into consideration so that they will pay attention to what you are saying. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard enough to get an audience, especially an audience that really needs the education, that you don't want to uh, distract them and give them anything negative to say about you because mm -hmm. Quite frankly, they already have a, a whole laundry list of negative things to say about you. Don't add lighting to that. Right. It's, it's kind of crazy because even if they are, are neutral to your topic, mm -hmm. they're being fed day in, day out, just, just subliminal messages on how, um, I mean, one day I was watching the news and they were talking about gun, uh, gun violence and and a active gunman, right? And it was someone who had went on a rampage and started by running over a couple people, crashing their car into a glass window, into a store, getting out with a machete, slashing several other people, and then overpowering someone, a police officer, taking their firearm, and then shooting someone. And they called them a gunman. Right. And I'm like, the very last thing that they did after well, it, all the other violence, all the other kinds of violence of that they, yeah. And it didn't even, I don't think it even had to do with the, no. whether it was the last one thing or the first no. thing. I think it was the fact that it was just, a, it's a handy word that they can use that propagates that agenda, that Absolutely. it just populates it and says, this is, you know, this is just, it's, it's a, they reach back and it's right there on their shelf of, of candy keywords yes. to use. Oh yeah, um, we have a lot of uh, click words in mm -hmm. the industry. You know, different right. things that we say or that we, how we present things that make people that our audience, our target audience, that get them engaged. The other side has those as well. One mm -hmm. of those is mass shooting mm -hmm. instead of a mass killing, or. Um, assault weapon instead of actually talking about what the weapon is gun violence instead of just calling it violence there they have all of these terms that they know grab people's attention just like we do and it's it's always amazing to me how much better theirs are marketed i mean they really have a much much better marketing team than we do as far as as all that use or, I, I yeah I don't I don't disagree with that and I think that they're much more cohesive as a, as a group so it's kind of we're they're all moving in the same yeah. direction and we're like oh we're all individuals so so right yeah. so so having things like AMCON or Gun Rights Policy Conference or any of the major conferences or anything that the DC project does when they bring everybody together right. those have so much value because then you can talk about what's happening in Kansas, what's happening in Ohio, what's happening here, how are you doing something, what are, what are you doing, what's working, what's not working. Right. Oh, getting everybody on the same page, um, that, that really is a struggle. Like you were saying that everybody uh, on our side is really individualist. Mm -hmm. We really are. And so that's, that's really why we're all in this to begin with is our individual rights. And we all preach about our individual rights but it really is it takes all of us collectively working in the same direction you don't have to be best friends with people that you're working with um you can have a working relationship you can have alliances um and then not speak to them 
mm-hmm. for eight months out of the year and then see them again. But the, the mission is that we are all on the same page. We're all driving in the same direction. And we cannot do that without um, having these opportunities to everybody get together, everybody build relationships and um, find out what's working in different markets so that we can we can really all start using the same terminology mm-hmm. and we can all head in the same direction instead of everybody running around like cats that someone is trying to herd <laughs> <laughs> right. because you know how well they don't they don't herd no they're not talking no. to you they're not looking at you they're not going anywhere you want right? them right like, yeah ah, nope Mm-mm. well no. and you would think um with dc project especially mm-hmm. it's it's this big group of women and not type, only type a personality yes, not women. only are we individualists and type a but we're all women <laughs> so right. it's it really is just it's it's a huge blessing to know that we can all come together and work together and be looking towards the same goals. And as different as all of us are, we all have the same passion for our freedom and mm-hmm. our ability to protect ourselves and our families. And it's just, it's amazing. And I'm pretty sure it's a miracle. <laughs> well, there's that, Holly Sullivan puts it the best and it's, she's like, I, I found the DC project and I realized that there were women out there just like me, and I had never seen that before. Right. And so it was it was so great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, with, before One Million Moms Against Gun Control, before I got involved with that, mm-hmm. um, I was one of those girls that growing up I always had guys as friends, and mm-hmm. I, I didn't really not get along with women, but I didn't really gravitate towards spending time with them because I liked doing the, the tomboy stuff. And then all of a sudden I was with this group of women and I was like, wait a minute, you guys are like me. And they're all like, wait a minute, you're like me. <laughs> and now with the DC project, it's the same. It's and the it's, same. it really is so important that other women understand that you are not alone. We, we are out here that we're, mm-hmm. you're not a unicorn. There are other right. ones like right. you that believe that um, owning and, and being able to operate effectively firearms and protecting yourself and training others to be able to protect themselves those are important things and we want to help right i and there's there's a thing and part of it is is that we each one of us is paddling as fast as we can in our in our little area and um the thing that will happen is that something that i know can save you time or vice versa and so I, I love, I love like the library of you can pick up the phone and you can call, you can say, what do you know about this? Or what do you, what do you think about that? Or if I, I'm thinking about this, what, what things are going to trip me up that I'm right. not thinking about? Because your normal everyday friends can't even think in, in kind of in this depth of, well, one the vitriol that comes towards us and <laughs> and the the goals that because i think that disarming us disarming america is a life and death death situation yeah i think that they're talking about the fact that if they disarm us that that i as a woman i'm not as big i'm not as strong i'm not as fast so that is much more likely to make me a victim And so I feel like I'm fighting for my very life in fighting this to be able to have that ability to have that tool. Right. Um, If you cannot, if you don't protect your rights, you can't protect your life. If you don't stand up for your right to be prepared to protect yourself, you can't protect anything else. And so if it's, if it really comes down to it and they, they are pushing for gun control and they don't want you to have this gun or that gun or this much ammo or whatever, it really is them saying, yeah, well, we really don't think your life is worth that much. And it is incredibly insulting. And you really should take it as a personal insult. They are telling you that you are not worth being protected to the utmost degree. Mm -hmm. And it's is really devaluing human life and it's it's just sickening when you sit back and you actually think about it and unfortunately 
most people don't put that much thought into it. Mm-hmm. They see some kind of anti-gun something, and then they just go, yeah, they're scary. I just, I just don't know. Or the worst is when they say, well, it's okay for me to have them because I know, I know what I'm doing, but I don't know if so-and-so should have them, or I don't know if they should have this gun or that gun. That's the worst because then they're outright telling you, well, my life is worth defending. But I don't know about my neighbor. Right. And and deciding who can and who can't based on, I mean, based on skill set or color your skin or financial aspects. Yeah. Because the financial is the one where, where it's like, well, you have to take these 10 classes and then you have to wait this period of time and you have to drive. Chicago, the whole issue with the fact that to get a concealed carry license, you have to drive outside of Cook County so you have to, if you are if you live inside the city, you really have no cause to own a car. So now you have to find a way to get a car or you have to Uber or you have to do something to take an hour and a half trip outside the city to get to a range, to be able to take the training, to be able to go back into the city. And it's like financially, that is not a viable option for you. But yet we're gonna price it so far out of the range that you're going to live in the poorest underserved neighborhood and we're going to say yeah you're the ones who don't get to have guns because we're going to limit these things oh yeah that's uh, between that and the fact that if i live on this side of the street it's okay but Mm. if i live on this side of the street it's no longer okay and just the idea that um people are really basing the value of your life on where you can afford to live Okay. And they're basing the value of your life on how much you can afford to pay your state for the privilege mm-hmm. of exercising your right. It's It really is elita, elitism to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. And it's a, well, you know, your life isn't worth quite as much because you can't afford the things that we can afford. Sorry. And we can afford on on your taxpayer dollars to have personal security, but oh my goodness, you can't. But I'm you can't possibly have any reason to secure yourself. But right? I'm important because I'm an elected official, or I'm important right? because I'm I'm rich, or I'm yes. important because yeah. <laughs> and so those that that importance. Well, I'm important to my family. Yeah, I I am the you know I bring home money so that they all get to live indoors and <laughs> yeah. and be eat. warm and <laughs> eat and all of that kind of stuff. So to to them, I am one of the most important people in their circle. Right, right. So how can you how can you draw those those lines? Honestly, I think you yeah, kind of have to be a monster to be able to draw those lines to decide that my life is worth this amount and your life just isn't because you're not me. Right. There, there is so much of that. So tell folks about um, how they can get one knowledgeable about One Million Moms Against Gun Control. Is there, uh, do you have a website? Do you have like a newsletter or anything? How, how do they get news and how do they get involved and how do they, how do they get the feedback mm-hmm. to, to start their journey? All right. Uh, it is 1mmagc.org. Um, that's our website and then really we do a lot on Facebook under the number one million moms against gun control Um, and then we we put up a ton of content on Instagram under 1MMAGC and you can message us on any of those platforms you can actually on the website if you go and say that you want to volunteer on our website, it actually kicks you over to the DC project. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. It okay. does. That way, we can get more women involved in, in the DC. getting okay. involved at their state level, mm-hmm. so that they have access to their legislature um, that is closest to them. Because we all know that true change starts at the smallest level of government. The the level closest to you Mm -hmm. is where you can really start making a difference and that's that's very important to us yes so knowing who your trustees are knowing who your commissioners are knowing who your state rep and your state senator are school board right (laughs) those kinds of things i don't know um (laughs) i i live in a state right now that our school boards have have discovered 
that there are unacceptable books in high school that they have started to go to the school board meetings and read the books out loud and the school board is losing their shirts about the fact that they're like you're reading me porn right no well you put the porn in my library so oh, yeah. so you've made it available to my teenager i don't allow my teenager to right. read that they're yeah. they're not yet at a point where they can they can't drive on their own they can't make their own decisions yet you're saying oh they're adult enough to have these conversations uh no and if you are offended at the school board level because I'm reading you what you've put in front of my children. Yeah. No. So I'm laughing. I'm watching it and I'm laughing. And I'm watching mothers read the book, read a section, go, I don't know that word. Look it up on Wikipedia. Come back and read the interpretation of what that word means. And you can just watch heads roll. Oh, yeah. And it's... It really goes back to apathy. Most school mm -hmm. boards have no idea that that stuff is going on. Um, mm -hmm. The ones that do should absolutely be called out. Right. Um, the other ones, the ones that just have no idea what books are in their kids' library, um, yeah, that's why we have school board meetings. It's to educate them yeah. on this is what we found. And this and is this what we is, care about. Right? And, mm -hmm. and what are you going to do about it? Because you're in the position, we've put you in the position to do something about it, what are you gonna do? So you are our elected representative. And so we want you to represent us and we are voicing our concern for you to then take action. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just reminded my local school board that um, they actually are accountable to the people who elected them, to their mm -hmm. constituents and that the superintendent is accountable to us and by proxy basically we hire the school board the school board hires the superintendent so it is our job to manage what is go what is being managed mm -hmm. at the school level right people had no idea people were highly offended that and how dare I, you say that they, they were calling my school board um volunteers instead of elected representatives because people are not educated on who our representatives are mm -hmm. and it's one thing if somebody gets a lot of media a lot of press their their household name then everybody kind of goes oh yeah that's that's one of my reps they don't think about it as far back down as the school board and they are really the closest thing and the easiest way that we can get started in being involved in making a difference in our own community and if we can make a difference in our own community then we can eventually make a difference in our state and if we can make a difference in our state eventually we make a difference on the national level and, but we all have to start somewhere well and the other part is is that we have entrusted with them our greatest treasure yes so I mean I don't think my county commissioners have my greatest treasure no the school board and the teachers have the next generation they do they have you know the love of our lives yes our children and so we we should care more at that level than we care about any other level and we should know more about that level than any other level and so so keeping it all politics are local and keeping yes. it local to your area is is really that so what's the um what's the response being from your from your or do you, would you prefer not to not uh, to talk about that? Well, I I certainly I've I've made I've made the right friends, and at the same time, I think I have made the right enemies. Because if you feel that parental rights are are below you as as an elected representative, if you really have no respect for parental rights, then um, you're it's probably safe to say that we're we're not on the same page <laughs> right i saw one state that the school one of the the school union went to the state to complain that the parents were complaining to the school board yeah it was yeah some something and it was like wait 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 that's the parents first and true job is to raise their children and raise them in a manner in which it mirrors and mimics their morals, their ethics, their beliefs, and the beliefs of that community. Right. Um, 
I think I just read something this morning just in passing because I had to roll my eyes and shake my head and get ready for day two of AMCON. And, um, <laughs> but apparently there was a group that has petitioned the White House to get involved and send representatives to school board meetings because the parents are now being seen as the enemy. I think that they uh, called us domestic terrorists. And um, <laughs> being Second Amendment, we're really used to that. A lot of these parents that are just now getting involved in their local politics are not used to being called names like that. Mm -hmm. And words have meaning. And so I think we are going to see a huge turn of people saying, wait, I have not been involved before, but I'm getting involved now. Watch me go. Hear yeah. me roar. Yep. Right. I can't wait. It's going to be great. <laughs> it, it is. I love it when a segment of society wakes up to, um, and there's there's a meme, and it, and it's a and it's a guy standing on the guillotine, and 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 the and he's got he's got like whatever the latest news buzz is written on his shirt, and beside him is is another guy who's got a second amendment written on his shirt and, and he looks at the, fir the one guy and he's like first, first time, time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yep. like okay we have been there we get that oh, yeah. exactly because it's it's a it's it's amazing but so you are so do you get involved in things like protests counter protests voicing your opinion when somebody somebody comes to town or something comes to town I try really hard not to do too many counter protests. Okay. Um, we do a lot at the state level as far as rallies at the Capitol and okay. things like that. Um, my mission is really education. So I try really hard to yeah. go and make sure that I am speaking about something I'm for okay. as opposed to just being a voice against. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I go to my school board right now, it's against. When they do something that I can approve of, then I will go and speak for, and mm -hmm. um, I will give them that opportunity. But when I go to the state capitol, if it's just for a rally, then I'm there to be in support of and try to get other people in support of. Um, <laughs> The anti or the counter protest that I have usually been anywhere near mm -hmm. are so vehement and disrespectful that their message really can get lost okay. in that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I try really hard not to participate in those things. Now, there are some that absolutely, like when I go to my school board and I tell them, what I'm thinking and what the actual rules of the game are, um, I am not really talking about what I am for. I, I'm mostly calling them out on what they are doing that I'm against. But most of the time, try to I the try positive to road. be positive okay. and I try to educate as far as this is what this is what it should like look like and this is what we should be doing okay i try try that that makes sense yeah. so i had <laughs> learned not long ago that if there is a protest that is counter to what i believe that's happening <laughs> and no one has staged a counter to that protest that if a singular person with a sign shows up they get press so that huh. the news is like oh i'm looking for somewhat balanced right right yeah right <laughs> so but, they can play it off as so they can play it off reporting. as balanced reporting <laughs> but if you are the only person then you get an opportunity and so huh. um so so i learned that and um the interesting thing was is that there was a rolling rally that was moving across the country that was making national news and i found that it was coming to the town that i work in at lunchtime and so I, I, I went to my boss and I was like, excuse me, I'm taking a long lunch. He's like, what are you doing? Well, I need some cardboard. I'm making a counter sign. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm going to I'm going to counter protest the protest. And he's like, you're going to what? Just watch the news. But, <laughs> but it's, it's really Not bail money. <laughs> it's really simple. No, because there, you just kind of stay on the outside yep. and you get an opportunity to say, I don't agree with what they're saying. And right. here's the reasons why. 
And so if you get to voice that without having to wade into the melee of it, yeah. it's worth your time and effort to do that. But if there's a lot of people, like I, I, am, I am so pro Second Amendment. I mean, absolutely pro Second Amendment to the 27 little words. But I am not a fan of um, like the the open carry gun walks with with the large quantity of guns. I'm just not, and um, I think that there's a place for that, but I don't think it showcases the thing like the DC Project does of professional women that are well spoken right. when everybody shows up and they're strapped on whatever the biggest gun is. They're wearing camo. They're they're and and their hope is to look intimidating, and right. it's like. No, I think you ought to be wearing stilettos and a red pencil skirt and drawing attention to the fact that you are female and yet accomplished. Right. I think it's a, I think it's a much better look. Yeah, it really depends on what message it is that you are actively trying to send. Unfortunately, a lot of people on the side of the Second Amendment um, advocacy really feel like they're anti-government. And we're not necessarily anti-government, we're anti-tyranny, we're anti-oppression. Um, we are pro-individuals. In fact, mm -hmm. in America, we, the people, we are the government. Um, if people would remember that. And so it, we, we really have to think through what we're trying to represent because mm -hmm. image is everything and if you are going to something and you are actively trying to promote um, long gun carry like if you're if your state is trying to get long gun carry I understand why you mm -hmm. would take that right if your state is trying to get open carry in certain areas then I I understand what you're doing mm -hmm. it's just not always effective and it's really not always a good look for us to be militant because that's how they portray us anyway and then mm -hmm. we become a caricature and it's it's distracting to the message if we are trying to say listen I am all of these things in the rest of my life and I'm a gun owner then you want to dress the part of all the other things you are in your life and as a side note because it's my right and responsibility I'm also a gun owner. Right. I am armed while I'm doing the right. rest of the things that I do. Yes. I'm not just armed because I'm armed. Right. I, I'm armed because I'm living my life and this is how I look when I live my life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's sort of where I am. I mean, but, that, but I'm, I'm not against them doing it. I just, for me, it is not, it is not a thing that I think is as, as successful right. as maybe one would hope that it would be. And I, I think that talking and just having conversations that show the professionalism of it and show the well-roundedness of yes. it and show that it is everybody, that it is anywhere from the choir director to the school bus driver to your tax accountant to an engineer to a guy who digs ditches. It doesn't, it right. just kind of doesn't matter. And and so it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter that it, that if you have a gun that oh I, I have to wear a camo. <laughs> I wear a lot of camo <laughs> in my real life. I also yeah. I'm a hunter. And okay. so, so yeah, yeah. So I, I have a reason to be wearing camo. Right. Um also, ladies, just as a side note, if you have camouflage shirts they hide all kinds of stuff. Okay. <laughs> all kinds right. of not because very it, attractive it creases. It breaks and, up the line. Yes, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is and why so it's, it's flattering. And it's why it's so successful as camo. Yes. So let, let's let's go off in, on a side note. Um, some states have passed um, other colors of camo to be used. So hunting, there's hunter's orange yes. and then there's that. But other states have now started to actually allow pink camo. Yes. Is that is that allowable in your state? It is allowable in Kansas. Okay. Um, I am not a pink camo person, and I have a lot of strong opinions about pink camo. Mm -hmm. But really, it's I I don't particularly care for a colorful firearms either. I'm okay. not. Uh, I don't. I don't want the gun because it's pink. 
generally speaking, I'm going to be concealed carry, so I want to have a matte black gun, something that is not flashy, that you're not going to see if, you know, something pops up. Or, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and so for me, um, I'm not really that into either pink camo or colorful firearms, but if that gets more women involved... If that's yeah. the thing that sparks their interest, if that's what I, if a woman walks into a gun shop and she sees a Tiffany blue gun and she goes, oh, wow, that's gorgeous. Buy it. That's, I, 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 that's try right. it and buy it. And if that's what? what gets you into it, then do it. If pink camo, if you want to wear it, wear it. I love it and I applaud you for doing it. I'm still going to stick with my with my real tree and <laughs> everybody's got a tree. See, I am a, um, I am a gun quality person first. I mean, so it's quality first, but I have to say that there, that there are guns that I have bought based, based on look that I make sure that it has the quality first yep. and then it has the look. And, um, I have an AR that is, um, the, well, it was actually painted bright pink and then it was painted like a ghost white over it and then distressed back to the pink. So oh. the more that you use it, the more that you carry it, the more that the pink kind of works its way out. And I, I just love how, how it yeah. looks. But it, first it works, and, it, it, you know, and it's a, it was bought based on name, brand, and quality and how, how reliable it is. And then, then it was, then it was kind of jazzed oh, up. Yeah. Then you made it fun. Then I made it fun because right. guns are fun. <laughs> I have a good time. I have a, yeah. a really good time with guns, and I have a good time, like going to training and learning oh, new yeah. skills, and then training with people who then become lifelong friends because yes. you go to go to a week long class, and pretty soon you have found more people from other states who are now just like you. Yes. <laughs> so, so are you a training junkie? I go when I can. Okay. <laughs> I also have three boys, and so I okay. don't get out as much. But one of my boys just picked up trap. Oh, okay. And so we get to take him, like, every weekend we get to go and spend hours watching him shoot trap. Okay. And it's, it's all new for him. And so I'm really, I mean, now I have an excuse. <laughs> now you can learn some. I, I, see, I have a... um. A personal mission that I say I will take a training class a year, yeah. a, a new one. So I, I pick something and it's something new and something different and something unique to hone skills, learn skills. So in addition to going to the range and doing right. that, and because I don't, I talked to a guy the other day and he was like, well, my trainer says this. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't have a trainer because I don't want to learn from one guy. Right. I want to learn from... Whoever is going to teach you. Whoever, yeah, yeah. because I'm going to get something, something different from everybody that I that I yes. train with, and so there may be some little nugget that makes this whatever I'm struggling with so much easier. Oh, absolutely. And besides us going to training and mm -hmm. doing um, something new and different, or learning a different skill, or whatever it is, the other big thing is taking somebody with you. And mm. watching them learn something, and that is that really. Since I do have kids, I, that's the biggest thing. Just watching them, because so, I the mean, especially moments. with yes, mm -hmm. especially with your own kids, uh, parents don't. I mean, yes, teach them gun safety. Yes, teach them, take them with you, and make it a normal family thing. Find a trainer. Find an instructor to work with your kids because your parent voice is, they will tune you out and all it takes is someone other than you <laughs> saying the same thing that you, you have told say. them a hundred times and all of a sudden it clicks and they get it and they, it's like they've heard it for the first time. Right. Because in fact they have heard it from the first time. Because the rest of the not, time they yes. were not listening. Yes, because the, the parent voice. Well, and I, I think that's a great idea. Um, one of the best things that I learned from an instructor was that as an instructor goes to teach children, they say, first, I want to interview the parents. Yes. I want to find out how the parent stores the gun. I want to find out how the parent does this. What are the home rules? What are all of those things? And as long as they align and do not conflict with gun safety, then I will tailor my training to align with how the parent does it. 
so that the so that the child gets a message that aligns and herds them in in the same the same kind of direction right. i was like that's brilliant oh it really is and it goes back to the all of us working in the same direction together mm -hmm. it's and that is at your core family level of everybody working in the same direction for the same cause and that is safety in your home and mm -hmm. so if you can find an instructor that will tailor something to your kids and your family and how you're structured that that is amazing and i i would venture to guess that there would be a lot of parents out there that would be hiring those instructors and pay a premium because it, it because, aligns and they yes. don't have to worry about a conflicting message or a counter message or, right or my instructor said this dad and i don't have to do what you said because they said you yes. know and you're like oh it's the same thing it's just they said it differently yes. than I do. yep yeah whatever that is right yes. oh yeah well this has been amazing so is there anything that you think that the that the uh, women for gun rights audience needs to know about you about kansas about a one million mon moms for against one million moms against gun control. That's why we do Ugh. one one M M A G C. <laughs> one M M A G C <laughs> dot org, and so that's their website. But so what? Is, what last things do you want them to know? Okay, um, really the most important thing that I can impart to any woman that is thinking about getting involved or that has gotten involved is, if you're thinking about it, do it. I, I cannot stress this enough. You have to start somewhere. Never think that, oh, well, I don't know this, or I, I'm not real sure about that. Just get involved. There are plenty of us out here who are more than willing to have conversations with you and find out where you, where you are and then walk you through the process. Um, if you are someone who is already out there getting stuff done and doing something, Thank you. Thank you so much because we need that. We need so much more of that. Women are the biggest driving force in the Second Amendment movement right now. Between all of the new owners, and the new gun owners, and all of the women trainers that we have been able to prop up and, and help them succeed over the years, and then the women who are going before Congress and mm -hmm. speaking on behalf of the rest of us saying, you know, this is who I am. This is why it's important. We need more of that. And quite frankly, all of the moms out there, um, since I do help run a mom organization, you are spend so much more time with your kids than anybody else on the planet and it is imperative that you teach them around the dinner table the breakfast table every table you teach them what their rights are where their rights come from and why they are so important because if we're not teaching our children and our coming generations that then we won't have any opportunity to exercise those rights and that is it really all comes down to you need to train up the next generation. Train them in what their rights are, train them in safety, and then as they get older, train them in proficiency because God forbid they need to have that. These are the most important things in our life and we, we need them to be around. And it, it makes all the difference in the world if you are a woman and you can stand up and say, I am empowered, I am protected, and I am doing something to empower and protect others. Right, because a right that we don't defend is a right that's lost that the next generation doesn't even know existed. Yes. And that's... And I, I'm not I, willing to do that to my children or my grandchildren. No, nope. and it's, it's, a, it's a fight worth fighting. So folks, thanks so much for tuning in for Women for Gun Rights, and we will see you again next Friday. So tune in for another amazing gal doing amazing things in her state for the Second Amendment. And if you want to, join dcproject.info and um, see what's happening there because it's, it's some pretty good stuff happening in your state, in my state, in every state. Every state.